Um, so I'm the PI for the green. Well, first of all, I should say, um, Michaela did an awful lot of the work in putting this Jupyter notebook together and Scott did um, a lot of the upfront work on um, some of the code that's used to implement it. Um, so I'm the PI on the Greenland ice map, ice sheet mapping project, which is um, now more than 15 years old. We just got renewed for the fourth time. What we do is we produce um, ice sheet velocity products. We produce ice sheet imagery. Uh, so we do annual velocity maps. We do, um, does the cursor? Yeah, it does. Good. Um, we have um, maps of velocity every six to 12 days, depending on the Sentinel sampling at the time, uh, monthly, uh, every three months and annually. So um, it, it's becoming quite a lot of data. And we do this, these image mosaics all around Greenland at 25 meter resolution. Um, I think we have over 400 of them now at um, so very large data set. We also have the, uh, the GRIMP DEM and we also have these um, uh, Terrasar X individual um, finer resolution maps of, of several of the glaciers around Greenland. We have ice fronts, we have um, a bunch of landside imagery. We're also working on a launch project product, but that's not out there yet. So um, we, it's getting, it was getting to the point where, uh, to, you know, nobody wants to download two or three terabytes of SAR images and keep them on their laptop just to look at a particular glacier. Um, and so it, it, from the point of view of our project, it's, it's not worth producing data sets if people can't access them. So we spent a lot of time, um, trying to make it easier to access these data. Um, right now this code is sort of customized to these products, but it could be generalized or the same concepts could be used for other data sets. Um, a lot of, um, I guess maybe I'm an old programmer. <laughs> likes modular code and that sort of thing. So um, a lot of the tools we've actually built are in Python um, modules and not just in um, Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, Daniel Shapiro works with me, said uh, a Jupyter Notebook is a poor place to store code. Um, so whenever I find myself doing something more than once or twice in a notebook, I usually put it in a Python routine. Um, so, uh, I want to go over how to access these products. Um, uh, I'll explore the header um, product info that that's basically what we already saw this morning. I'll, I'll have lots of Dask maps, um, how to interactively subset these data so we can pull the part just that we're interested in and actually save them. I do think at times there are some of these, um, I'm going to show you really quick examples that just work with the annual data, but if you were pulling from that stack of 400 and a nice chunk, it still might take enough time to go get a cup of coffee or something like that. And you don't want to do that all the time when you can just dump it to a, say, 50 megabyte or 100 megabyte uh, uh, file, CNET CDF file, and do and work on it on the plane on your way to AGU. So get your last minute talk done. Um, I'll, I'll revisit some of these concepts, lazy opens, um, without actually downloading the data. and. Um, it's a little bit about combining raster and vector data. And also I have a love-hate relationship with um, X-Array and you know I, I love it sometimes, but sometimes we do really complicated things. It's so easy. And sometimes the easiest thing can take me a, an hour of surfing the web to how to do some complicated little things. So um, I tried to actually hide some, leave all that functionality there for people who want it, but also kind of hide some of that for the people who, who don't want it. So a lot of the plotting and things um, we, we do um, under the hood of the code. All the notebooks and everything can be found on the GRIMP overview repository. Um, and there are um, uh, lots of other tutorials there as well. Um, and is there should be a plug for... Um, I'm not sure what happened to it, but there should be a plug. Something. Michaela has made some nice... Um, uh, we even have a GRIMP channel on YouTube, so... You can, okay. So, um, so uh, everything we used is mostly using cloud optimized geotiffs. And in case it wasn't said earlier, the, the beauty of a, a cloud optimized geotiff, it, it's just a geotiff. But someone said, well, hey, what happens if we put the header up front and we put the pyramids in, in an organized way? And if we chunk it in a consistent way, then we have a much more useful product. 
and especially the header information, because all you have to do is do one read of that header, and then you know everything about the file, where everything is, and how to go get it. Um, if you just randomly, with some older code, made a geotiff, you might have that header information all throughout the thing. The in between each pyramid, for example, might have the header belong with the pyramid, and then you wouldn't know where anything was. So um, this is um, cogs are just so much better than regular geotiffs. Um, and actually, I'll say for NISAR, we're going to be, which is the NASA Israel SAR mission, everything is going to be in HDF, but there is some attempt going on to try and make the, the HDFs a little more cog like um, by, by putting all the header information up front. So the tools I'm going to describe are built on X Array and Dask. I won't go into that anymore since you. Um, and we'll go over local and remote subsetting. So um, I don't know if I want everybody to follow with me or not, because um, the problem is um, NSIDC, uh, I think it's they don't want denial of service. So they limit the number of accesses from a particular IP. And I don't know how much these machines share the I go out looking like the same IP. So if everybody does everything at the same time, you'll probably get a file not found or some kind of error like that. And usually if you just wait a little bit, it'll have to work again. But we could end up breaking things. So we also have um, look, everything we can do here locally. We, I mean, through the cloud, we can also do it locally on the disks when Michaela put the data sets online or on, on the scratch space here for us to use. Um, and actually, for that reason, with Dask, I also usually set the workers that most too, because um, I don't know how quickly it hangs up those connections, but um, it can quickly die. Uh, just really quickly, um, this can run on um, in the cloud here, but it'll run just as well on your notebook um, back at, you know, on, your, on any kind of reasonable network. I think Scott got it to work at a hotel room in Australia. So um, it is really powerful what you can do, uh, even with a low bandwidth connection. Uh, those of you new to Python, um, Conda and Mamba and all that stuff, they're wonderful in some ways, but you can get code working and then all of a sudden it breaks because some package updates or it one time curl had one version of curl had something wrong with it works great on one machine and, and on another one, I spent a day tracking that down. So anyway, if you want to install it on your own machine, it's best to build your own environment that we've already tested. Um, so um, this is the old uh, having to install um, the things with pip. I don't think this will do anything because uh, I find if you put the try things, it'll avoid re and, um, reinstalling. I'm not sure what it's doing. Maybe I didn't. I thought I'd run it beforehand, but maybe I logged out and ran but logged back in. Okay, and I guess, I don't know if I really need to restart the kernel, but anyway, just to be safe. It's time to just skip over all of that. Okay, and then there's a lot of, um, yeah, and here's where I set the number of workers to two, just, and actually, even when I've got it working with more, somehow it doesn't speed up things um, in terms of having parallel network connections within NSIDC. So this login, um, it's a little different and maybe at some point we could, uh, Amy, it'd be nice to get it working with the other login. If you just do the other login, it won't work because it needs this cookie file um, that tells GDAL how to get things. So this routine I wrote, uh, if I didn't already have a NetRC, it would have popped up a login window uh, I would have logged in much like what you saw with Amy. But this also makes the cookie file and it also updates your NetRC file. If you aren't comfortable having your password in there, um, then at the end of things, you should get rid of the NetRC file. But you know, as long as you're not using the same password for your bank account, I think if someone hacks your Earth Data account, it's probably pretty safe. Uh, oh, here's Michaela's um, great tutorials. So um, we store, um, and, and I probably, if I had to do it over again, I might do things differently, but I, um, we didn't actually put a separate metadata file. Everything is in the um, 
a lot of the information isn't like the date information is in the file name, um, sort of like those format strings we were looking at for ISAT earlier today. Um, so that's where I pull all the date information from. Um, so it has this sort of long format. What just happened? Seems to have disconnected me. Is anyone else having problems? Um, no, no, I mean, I was using it earlier, so uh, it shouldn't have, but I think Huh. Okay, well, I'm just going to actually do this too. Yep. Okay, so um, we heard about um, the CMR before and um, with some help from Scott, we wrote this little panel-based um, search tool that's specific to our, um, our products, but you can essentially search, it'll come up with just the annual products at first, but there's um, quarterly velocity, monthly velocity, six, 12 day velocity, you can search for any of those. We're gonna just go with the annual velocities. Um, and there's some different modes that let you access um, the different sets of um, products, but it, um, for now, I've just customized it for um, particular products. So um, this does the search and it pulls um, in this little pandas window over here. It These are the products it found. And can we get into, um, so here are our products. So this um, object has the name that you just to get cogs. It gives you the name of the cogs and you, um, you just replace the, there's a VV, a VX, an EX, EY, there are all these different ones. So we, we just replace that with a wildcard star here and strip off the TIFF off the end because it, it knows that it's going to be a TIFF file. Um, so, um, so in th this first example, we're going to do a, um, we have a lot of the options shown here, so I'm not going to go into all the details of those, but it says URL equals false, and that just means we're working on a local file. So here we did, this should look familiar to you by now. If not, you're probably in the wrong room. Um, but there's uh, these chunking done and these nice DAS graphs indicate it's um, still in DAS land and has not actually been loaded. And you can see, um, oh yeah, another important thing I should point out, this overview level equals one. So that's a nice thing about COGS is the pyramids. So it's the full res data, the half res data, the quarter res data, and down to whatever res makes sense. Um, so let's say you want to look, as we are in a second, a map of Greenland and make a plot. You do not want a 30,000 or whatever it is image by 30,000. It's it's going to um, it's it's going to bog down show and if nothing else, and you won't be able to resolve it on your 1,000 pixel screen. So um, here we, um, so basically we have this um, velocity series object and it can, it, it's designed to take a series of um, images. Right, right now we're only gonna do one, start out with a local file name, and then we do read the series from TIFF. And then if I just, again, you get to the X-ray if you want. So my velocity series.xr, there's the X-ray. And if we want to display it, there's a display velocity for date. You put in the date and you can set up whether you want a log scale, a non-log scale. And it's really designed to pretty much make publication ready figures. You can tweak the various parameters in one call, get a, a pretty nice looking plot. Um, so now I'm going to do the same thing. Um, well, slight, I'm going to make a slight variation on it. This time I gave it that full list of cogs. So now I'm giving it... Um, uh, 
seven cogs, but I'm only asking it to plot one. So here's another plot. I think this is a different year. It's, yeah, it's a year earlier. And we get, um, again, a nice plot, but you can see it it did the, um, the DASC thing. And so um, I think this was alluded to earlier today. When you're displaying the data, it has to obviously read the data to display it. But if I do this again, it hasn't actually saved the data. If I do it again, it, it, it might even be a little faster because the operating system has buffered the data, but it's, um, it's still going and reading the data again and again. And so that may be efficient or it may not be efficient. Um, so um, I'll show in a minute how we get around that, but I just want to call attention to it now. So um, we also have a subset of the data, which is shown here. Um, right now, that's actually the full data set. And again, you can see it's seven time series deep and uh, velocity and the three different components of velocity. And uh, uh, this one, I think, is a little bigger than the last one. Um, so now we want to subset that data. We do have an interactive box picker, but I'm, I'm just going to leave that for now. But there's some instructions on how to do that if you're interested. So we're going to do manual selection. So I just put in some random coordinates here and round them off to three to kilometers. And we can basically compute a bounding box this way. And then we're going to do this. Um, we apply this subset velocity with this bounding box. And that's essentially going to crop, just do a, an X-ray. I forget the exact command, but it's, it's just cropping the data and um, setting up a few different things. So now our subset is actually much smaller. Um, and it's gone from a much more manageable side. This was uh, 520 megabytes. Now we're looking at um, 71 kilobytes, so it's quite small. Again, it's still all sitting at NSIDC. It's not here yet. Now we can um, do our display for the date again. And there you can see, um, see the data. Um, all displayed. And we'll do the same thing with the remote access data set. This time, um, though, we're going to work with a full data series. So it's um, a 200 meter resolution. So it's quite big for Greenland. And this time, 8 gig. So again, we can chop it up again. Um, now, um, as I mentioned earlier, the um, when I when I show that plot, it will keep reloading the data every time, and and that's often not what you want to do, especially if you're making lots of different plots. So the way to get around that is to execute this load remote um, on the subset, and that's essentially doing a DAS compute, which um, loads the data into memory. So now this memory is locally on disk. I think there's a few other things, a bit of housekeeping it does. But now we've downloaded the data, and just as you saw earlier, we've gone from the, the um, nice-looking DAS gra uh, graphics to sort of the, the more um, kludgy X-ray graphics. Scott, are you going to fix that for us? What's that? <laughs> OK. And now we'll just plot this version, which um, I used a higher over or a different overview level. Now you can see the same figure again, but it's um, much higher resolution. So we can um, save that to net CDF. And um, now we've got it saved um, as a net CDF that we can reload. So just to review this part before moving on to the next. Uh, the GRIMP data sets, as many other data sets we've been talking about, um, are very large. So with these tools, we can preview these data sets. We can subset them. Um, we can pick a resolution we want to download at. Sometimes I'll um, say download the full um, data for that like plot of Jakob Shavan I just showed, full res, but then I'll download all of Greenland to do a little inset map for location or something like that. We can uh, apply these tools local disk, remote HTTP links, S3 buckets, whatever you want to do. And um, they work quite well on a crowd, uh, cloud-based platform like we're using now, or you can do it on your own um, laptop.
And if we want, we can save the results for later analysis. So now I'll just go over a little bit um, on using um, the data for, for plotting. So um, Michaela here's demonstrating, again, we she did something like this and saved this um, file for um, Steenstrup Glacier, another X-Array. Um, you can just loop over those, the dates in this and plot each one. And so we can actually see the time series of speed Uh, which uh, doesn't look all that interesting here. It's hard to see. So how about we look at the anomalies or the differences between each of those panels and the mean velocity. So we can just um, compute another command here, velocity anomaly, or um, and compute the mean. And then we similarly, we just loop over these, generate a figure, and now we can see that the Speed on this glacier has changed um, quite a bit over time. Um, is there a way to hide the? Uh, uh, that that's better. It keeps blocking the screen. Um, so we can see that the glacier was um, moving slower than average. Um, from about 2016 on, and then it started to speed up in the last few years. Uh, we can also um, combine the GRIMP data. So we do do these um, ice fronts. So every ice front in Greenland has been digitized. Oops, I skipped over this part. You can also use this inspect tool if you um, want to examine the glacier at different points. We take advantage of the hollow views part of the code and you can just um, pick a point and um, examine it. So we also, um, yeah, we, we produce these ice fronts. Um, so Michaela's put together 12 years of the terminus data here and they're all combined. You can see them all around Greenland. Um, and we can clip those um, using some of the nice functions they have in GeoPandas. So um, we take our bounds, we make a box, we clip the box, and um, then we can just plot this. So these are the ice fronts that correspond to the glaciers we were just looking at. And we can plot those over the um, set up here so that you start out with the first one and then they keep adding the, the front so you can actually see the front retreat of the glacier front over time. Um, we can also do point plots or profile plots. I'll only go over the point plots today, but I've, I've just picked three random points here some colors, some symbols, and the name of the points. And um, these functions so we again use our, our display velocity for date. And again, there's quite a lot of um, functionality. Um, for those of you who aren't that familiar with, you can always shift tab and get um, get all the documentation for um, what the actual parameters are. And so we just uh, loop over them. Uh, we do the plot, but then we loop over the, the map axes, and plot the points, loop over the plot axes and plot the points. And you can again see what we were just looking at, that there's been this speed up, especially near the terminus um, over the last few years. Um, and the inland stuff is, is speeding up, but but not quite as dramatically. So to review, um, we can uh, use this class to compute st uh, statistics on the full stack. There's some standard deviation and other functions. A lot of the X-ray functions are in there. Um, it can be used to produce point profile plots. Um, and we have a, a tutorial on, on plotting flow lines um, to do the profiles. Um, I didn't discuss the image series class today, but that um, will actually do something similar with all of the, the imagery. And we have the SAR imagery and um, 
a nice scaled version for looking at, and we have a calibrated versions, both sigma naught and gamma naught. And um, yeah, there's just a lot of other notebooks in this repository. And since I have a little bit of time, uh, Tash, I'm gonna focus on another aspect of CryoCloud, which is um, you guys have a, a nice XF, S, XFCE interface. So you can get an actual Linux desktop um, and run other programs besides just doing things. So um, here's Johnny's lakes he was just looking at. Um, so what's nice about these these links with the um, the login procedure I used, you can um, load into um, QGIS, for those of you who use QGIS, um, that full two terabyte data set and have it sitting at NSIDC and navigate it um, really quite quickly. Uh, let's see. Zoom to native resolution or... So there's 400 of these maps in here. Um, the only time you can really, or the way you can get into trouble with this is if you click like 15 boxes or 16 boxes and then try and do it, it will try and load too many at once and then you'll get one of those errors. And then at that point, just start on checking things um, and, and try again. It, it's not a fatal error, but um, you can zoom in anywhere you want to look at pretty much any year. Uh, since 2015, um, I think uh, this one just has the, doesn't have the um, calibrated data, but it just has the raw data. But it's it's super nice just for um, accessing these data. And again, it's, I think you use this from your hotel room in Australia too, right, Scott? Yeah, it's, it amazes me that you can browse high resolution imagery so quickly. Um, and I think it's only going to get better because uh, our project is still out in the, we're, we're not in the cloud yet from NSIDC's point. We're still <laughs> um, just on regular HTTP links so the, or HTTPS links. So um, these work, there's a little bit of setup you have to do. You have to set a couple of environment variables and those are sh shown in the notebook. Um, and uh, you also have to do, you have to have that NetRC file. Um, and there is actually and one thing I hate um, about uh, QGIS is, is you can spend a lot of time clicking and loading things. And we have a notebook that will um, essentially let you, this whole uh, notebook or, or QGIS project was built um, in a Jupyter notebook. So uh, it, it sometimes it depends on what machine you're on and how you can access the QGIS libraries, but you can access the QGIS libraries in a notebook and build uh, these projects um, uh, automatically. This will run in a couple of minutes. So these, the notebook to do that is on the Grim um, website. Uh, and uh, yeah, really um, um no, but I, sh I've, I had some older ones there. I, I'm going to actually start. What I need to do is update them every time I make a new addition of data to the website. Um, so I think that's something we're going to do with the new project. Uh, this one. The notebook will build a QGIS project and you can specify which products you want. It's, it, it takes, even when I go, it's a little, it's hard to make it simple, but it, it's fairly well documented. But every time I go and look at it, I have to actually remind myself what I did. Um, um, but I, I think we are going to plan also to make the notebooks available um, for the different velocity products. One one thing that might work better is, what is that, a Q, QLR? There's, a, there's kind of a, a layer definition file you can create. And if we just publish those, people can pull on um, what they want into their notebook. Um, for example, for for these, when you have um, too many files, um, sometimes QGIS, uh, you have to actually manually reset the number of descriptors, the file descriptors that are allowed open. So 
this fee for someone who doesn't want to have to do that. We could just, if you just want the velocities for a particular year, um, you could import particular layer definition files. But that's something Scott, Michaela, and I will have up and running in a few months. So I think that's it. But it was. Um, It was really nice having all these other talks lay the groundwork because it made everything I had there. Yeah. We have any questions in the room or online for Ian? That is in the Grim Prix Pro. Um, and the, the biggest problem I've had is just depending on uh, Q just where it puts the libraries and how to do the import. Um, uh, I think maybe Condis could just, maybe if you're using the system libraries on a Linux machine, it won't do it, but I've had problems trying to get, I don't know, what, they leave you the capability to do that, but they don't really make it easy. Um, and it's also all reachable through, um, and it's like, if you go to the Grimp website, at NSIDC, you can go straight to a repository. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The comment was that there's a link um, in the repository or on this on this notebook at the top to get to the, re the repository where all these um, code, all this code, all these notebooks are stored. There's kind of one master repository that's just basically a readme file that points people to all of the other parts. 